Hello again. I've been looking at this book lately. It's called The Return of Race Science. It bears on the front cover a recommendation from Rennie Edo Lodge. And that alone makes me deeply suspicious. Edo Lodge is the author of this book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. It's dreadful. Both these books are bestsellers. Uh, and they're Sunday Times bestsellers, what's more, and endorsed by The Guardian and so on, which is uh, not necessarily a good thing. Both of the books are deeply dishonest and written in bad faith. I say this because they both denounce and dismantle a version of racism which no sensible and informed modern person believes in. In other words, they attack a straw man and have no difficulty at all showing how wrong is the belief system which they set out to destroy. Of course it is easy because they're essentially arguing about views of race which were current in the 19th century, views which are hopelessly outdated. Let me explain. In the 19th century it was believed that there were four or five separate and distinct human races. These were the Caucasian, Mongoloid, Negroid and so on. The idea was that these were like separate species and that they had probably arisen separately in different parts of the world. They all had separate features and for races to mix was as unnatural as a dog mating with and having offspring with a cat. It was against the natural order of things. These modern anti-racists explain how false this view of humanity is and that we all belong to one species and all have a common origin. All modern humans, they say, have mixed ancestry and we are all, in that sense, mongrels. This is all almost certainly true, but tells us precisely nothing useful about the world. I do not believe in separate races and I readily acknowledge that we are all ultimately of mixed ancestry. This does not, of course, mean that there is no difference between the average black person and the average Chinese person or that the average white person is no different from those other two. It means that we need to talk about statistical differences rather than absolutes. I can say nothing sensible, for example, about every white person or every black person. A white person might be a slow-witted fool, and a black person might gain a first in mathematics from Oxford University, as two people today have informed me, by the way which I shall make the subject of my next video. The question is, what percentage of white people are slow-witted dullards, as opposed to the percentage of black people, or the proportion of those from East Asia? Are those of sub-Saharan heritage as likely to be geniuses as those whose family are from East Asia? It is clearly not the case that every Chinese person <laughs> is a genius, and every black African a fool. We must look at averages. If I meet a black person, I've got no conceivable way of telling whether he's more intelligent or less intelligent than me. There's an excellent chance that he will actually be more intelligent. I'm only of average intelligence myself. This is because we are all of us, to a greater or lesser extent, mongrels, with all kinds of genes which we have inherited from our ancestors. The situation is precisely similar to domestic dogs. All domestic dogs today are descended from wolves, and if you go back 15 or 20,000 years, you will find only wolves among their ancestors. Similarly with humans. We are all descended from an archaic species called Homo erectus, which lived in Africa, Asia and Europe over a million years ago. Over the years, both modern humans and dogs emerged from those rootstocks, and now there is one species of dog, Canis familiaris, and one species of human, Homo sapiens. This means that all dogs and all humans have similar capabilities, of course. Oh wait, no it doesn't. If you want a dog for speed, you're better off with a greyhound or whippet rather than a poodle. 
If you want a guard dog, then a German Shepherd or Rottweiler is probably a better bet than a Labrador. Need intelligence for a sheepdog? Most people choose a Collie for that. Now, we must bear in mind that those breeds of dogs are also mongrels if you go back a few generations. Whatever the pedigree, go back far enough and you're going to find genes from other types of dogs. The purer the breed though, the more that the characteristics for which you are looking will be present. All dogs belong to a single species which originated in another single species, but they can vary differently in size, speed, character, temperament and intelligence. So we find books such as these dreadful things point out that African Americans are not a different race from white Caucasian Americans. Indeed, the average black person in the United States has around 15% white ancestry. In the same way, white people in America also have mixed ancestry. None of them belong to a pure Caucasian race. All true enough, but wholly irrelevant. This is what I mean when I say that modern anti-racists attack a straw man. Saini, by the way, the author of this one, The Return of Race Science, is Indian, and she devotes a chapter of this book to showing that Indians belonging to different castes are not genetically separate populations at all, but are also jumbled. Who would ever have guessed that? A lot of her book, by the way, is chatty and contains masses of irrelevant stuff like this. She's talking about visiting a race realist, and she says here... Da, 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 let's have a look. She goes to meet him. And... Ba, 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 ba. Sorry, I'm... Ah, yes. She describes Robert Plomin as tall, sporting a smart white beard and a crisp pale blue shirt. Now, what do I care what colour shirt the guy was wearing? I want to know why he holds these beliefs and whether or not his, he had evidence for what he says. So Saini is very good on telling us what colour of skin people are or what they're wearing or whether they've got beards or moustaches. She's not quite so good at citing sources. What neither of these books even mentions is the fact that those with a lot of African heritage tend to stand and walk earlier than those whose ancestry is mainly European. No mention <coughs> of the hormone levels in black men that, on average, there is 15% more circulating testosterone in black people, or any other of those awkward little facts that indicate real differences between ethnicity. By limiting their criticism to old ideas about race, it is not necessary for anti-racists to get to grips with the modern world. They can simply show that Francis Galton, who died over a century ago, was mistaken in some of his ideas about heredity. Mention the genetic inheritance of intelligence as evidenced in studies of identical twins? I know, let's mention Josef Mengele's at Auschwitz who conducted experiments with twins. That ought to be enough to stop people asking any more questions about that subject. By promoting the idea that modern race realists follow the same way of thinking as Victorian scientists, anti-racists are spared the need to tackle the real questions relating to ethnicity and race. It means that both anti-realists, anti-racists and race realists end up talking at cross-purposes and instead of finding what they might have in common, are always in opposition to each other. This really isn't helpful. In the video this evening, I'll talk about the person who contacted me about a Nigerian gaining, gaining a degree at Oxford University, and he headed his email, Bad News. This is part and parcel of the same problem I've sketched above, the idea that race realists regard races as being fixed and immutable, and every member of each race possessing definite characteristics and levels of intelligence, which is quite mad.